teach a new song the next couple weeks before we sing it on a Sunday. We're going to learn it some on Wednesdays. I know at least a few of our kids know it, so they're going to, we're going to prompt them to sing it out and teach us a little bit. Pretty simple tune, simple words, but a good reminder that we belong to the Lord. So we're going to sing that tonight. Uh, it's in my head because I, think, I don't can't remember. I think it's our middle school choir has been learning this song throughout the year. My office is right next to the choir room, and so I have heard this 300 times the last uh, two weeks. I thought we need to sing that together, and so we're going to learn it tonight, and uh, then we'll sing a couple other that are more familiar to us this evening. Father, thank you for your word that it is always true. And that we can trust it. Thank you for your grace that it is always available to those who believe in you. We thank you for the love that you express and show to us each day. And we pray that we would live our lives in response to those things. Obedience to your word. Gratitude for your grace. And in response to your love, may we love, serve you and love others and uh, serve them. And so we pray tonight that we would be reminded of that of the love and the grace you show in our lives. As we open your word in a little while, may we learn from the examples of uh, what displeases you and what pleases you. And may we follow you. Uh, Be with those that cannot be here tonight. May they know that their church family loves us praying for them. Even this evening, some watching online, we ask that you uh, guide, direct us, bring us back together soon and safely. Uh, We pray that even our praise and our prayers in the next hour or so would be pleasing, that it would be edifying to be in one another's presence tonight as a church family. Uh, We have children all the way down to the youngest age, uh, all the way up to the oldest among us, and we are just all grateful that you have called us together as your people. So may we encourage one another tonight, and may we follow you in Jesus' name. Amen. Eighteen, and the other in Proverbs 23. First Samuel 18, Proverbs 23, and be ready to read a couple different portions of Scripture tonight. Mark your place there in Proverbs 23. All right, put a marker there. We're going to come back to that in just a moment. And then open, if you would, to First Samuel 18. Over the last several, couple months, several months that we have been studying first through First Samuel, we've tried to place a little bit of an emphasis on reading scripture together i think that that is important to hear the word of god read aloud amongst ourselves it's good if you do that with your family at home as a couple with your children you should be doing that and even with other christians one-to-one bible reading there'd be something profitable just from calling up a friend or um, neighbor or meeting for just a moment and not having to study and do a whole thing just read the bible together So we want to do that again this evening. We want to put our eyes on uh, the verses that we're going to study. And so that we all can do that and all remain focused there as a family, if you're sitting there, or as a couple. Or if you're by yourself, slide over with somebody, see somebody sitting on their own, invite them over to sit with you. And divide up 1 Samuel 18, and then read through the passage aloud together. There's 30 verses, so depending on how many people you have, you can alternate verses or maybe take a chunk 10 verses at a time and then split that up Uh, but let's read our way through that we'll come back in just a moment and uh, we'll study that together all right first samuel 18 let's ask god to bless uh, the moment that we have together father bless the reading of your word it is the power of the gospel in us and by your spirit to teach us in jesus name amen all right let's read that together for just a few moments out loud and then we'll come back and study in just a minute I know some of you may not have made it all the way through. We will walk through it in just a moment, but I'm glad to hear God's people read His Word together. I think that's always just something uh, sweet about the sound of the Lord's Word in His children's mouth. If you have your place there, if you need to make your way back to your seats, you can do you can do that if you scoot around, or if you just want to stay where you are, that's fine too. But if you would, uh, look at Proverbs 23 just for a moment. We're going to use this to launch into our text that we just read about Saul and about David. 
Proverbs 23. And look down in verse 6, if you would. Kind of sounds like Saul. Remember, it says that he watched David. He kept him in his eye. He eyed him continually. So uh, Proverbs 23, verse 6. Eat thou not the bread of him that hath an evil eye, neither desire thou his dainty meats. For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Notice it does not say as he speaks with his mouth. What he says, it says what he thinks in his heart, so is he. Eat and drink, saith he to thee, but his heart is not with thee. That's where we take our title tonight and our topic in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 18. Turn back there, if you would, to 1 Samuel 18 and put a note there at the top. I kind of wonder a little bit if as Solomon who we believe penned the majority of the Proverbs. I kind of wonder when Solomon penned this, probably some from his own life experience, Proverbs 23, 7. But you you kind of wonder if he may have had his dad, David, if he had his father David in mind and David's relationships with Saul. Kind of sounds like it. Don't eat with the one that has an evil eye for you because what they say is not always what they mean. What someone thinks about you in their heart is who they really are. Don't always just trust their words. And it's not trying to get us just to distrust. But notice what he says. He says he says one thing, but his heart is different than that. And we're going to look at that tonight and look at what happens with David. In in chapter 17, last week we walked through a long chapter, the longest account of any story of event of David's life in all of Scripture. And rightfully so, the the big moment where he fights Goliath, where he declares his allegiance to the Lord, where he declares his faithfulness, his belief in the greatness and the power of God. And now yet he walks to another enemy. In 1 Samuel 17, his enemy is Goliath and the Philistines. In 1 Samuel 18, his enemy becomes Saul. In fact, if you were able to read through the end of the chapter a moment ago, you said it says that Saul became David's en- enemy continually. It wasn't that David disliked Saul and made him his enemy. It's that Saul chose to make David his enemy. And so we're going to see that after the defeat of Goliath, Saul does everything he could do to make David an ally under his own control. But Saul's intentions were sinister. His mouth did not match his mind and his heart. And the challenge tonight for us as Christians That should never be true of us as believers in Christ. The gospel, that Jesus speaks his honest truth to us. That's sort of the basis of the whole thought behind uh, that we should be honest with our mouths and with our hearts is that what God speaks to us is what is really in his heart. The fact that he says he forgives us is real and true. The fact that he says he offers grace is real and true. He does not, God does not tell us one thing, but think something differently. And we as God's people should do our best in under the power of God's spirit and by the leadership of his word and through Jesus Christ to follow suit and example. Now it says in this chapter, David forms a close friendship with Jonathan. We see that in the first four verses. That's not what we're going to focus on this evening because In the next couple chapters and a little further in the book, all the way to the end of the book, we see Jonathan's relationship with David, their friendship grow. That's not really what we're going to focus on tonight. We'll mention it, but particularly we're going to look at Saul versus David. The writer of Samuel has set these two men in contrast from the very beginning when it introduced both of them. We hear about Saul first and how his heart did not match his words for the Lord, how he loved religion, he loved spiritual things. Remember when they welcomed him after he uh, met with Samuel and was told he was going to be king? Remember they welcomed him with tambourines, they were singing and dancing, and Saul loved it. He loved going to the high place, the worship experience, if you would, but his heart was far from the Lord, and God rebukes him, and eventually Saul rejects the Lord's leadership and authority over his life, And he says, I will honor you with my words and even my religious actions, but I will not honor you with my heart. And because of that, God rejects Saul. And tonight, what we're really going to see is this discrepancy between Saul's mouth and his thoughts. And it should serve as a warning to us about double-mindedness. As James warns, a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. 
So I want us to notice a couple things tonight to kind of set us up. Notice that this was not, Saul did not know something about David that no one else knew. It wasn't like Saul was just some great judge of character or that Saul had the authority as the king to decide who God would use and who God wouldn't, who was important and who wasn't, who should be liked and who shouldn't. I want you to notice that everyone in the passage, number one, everyone loves David. If you, if you mark in your Bible at all, I want you to notice a few phrases that anytime there's a repetition where the same phrase, now we, we see it's some of the same words for us. Anytime there's the same phrase over and over in scripture, typically that repetition is there to teach us or to show us something. So look, if you would, at a few verses, look at chapter 18, verse number one, look at the last phrase. And Jonathan loved him, talking about David. Jonathan loved him. Look at, chap, uh, look at verse number three, middle of the verse. He made a covenant because he loved him. You go down to verse 16, chapter 18, verse 16. But all Israel and Judah loved David. Go over to verse number 20. And Michael, Saul's daughter, loved David. Verse 22, even Saul recognizes it. This is what Saul tells his servants to tell David. Look at the end of verse number 22. And all his servants love thee. All the servants of Saul love David. Look at verse number 28. Saul saw and knew that the Lord was with David and that Michael, Saul's daughter, loved him. So over and over and over in this passage, it's telling us how much everyone loves David. And it's not just a frivolous love. We're going to notice that as we walk our way through. It's not just, oh, they love him because he beat Goliath. There's some other very specific reasons for it. After the victory at the Valley of Elah, of course, David goes from obscurity. Nobody knows him, and he just rockets his way. And all of a sudden, people are singing. Literally, they're singing his praises throughout the streets of the different cities. So yes, there's an element of David is the hero. But I want you to notice that is not necessarily why the people in chapter 18 love David. Look at first, Jonathan loved David. Look at the beginning in verse number one. It came to pass when he had made an end of speaking unto Saul that, John, that the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David. Now, this, this is not saying just some other point in time. Same sentence, same phrase. It's one phrase attached to the other. It tells us that David was speaking with, John, with Saul and that as Jonathan heard David's heart and what he said, their souls were knit together. Remember back when Jonathan fought that battle against the Philistine garrison? He climbed the rocks with his armor bearer and he said, maybe the Lord will deliver us. And then Jonathan goes on and it's actually kind of echo. Actually, it doesn't echo. It kind of predates David's declaration in chapter 17 where he says, the Lord this day will the Lord know. In fact, let's, let's go there and look for just a moment. It's, it's easy. Look at verse 14, or excuse me, chapter 14. If I can find it right now. Oh, chapter 14. And uh, I don't work well on the fly, do I? Let me see. Ah, yes, verse 6. It may be that the Lord will, end of the verse, it may be that the Lord will work for us for there is no restraint to the Lord to save by many or by few. Doesn't that sort of echo the words? You can go back to chapter 18. Doesn't that sort of echo what David said? This day the world will know that the Lord does not save by sword and spear. I come in the name of the Lord. So Jonathan hears David talking. And he says, man, this is somebody that feels the same way about God that I do. This is somebody that thinks about Israel as God's people the same way that I do. There's already been indication that Jonathan is much more spiritual than his father Saul. And here, their souls are knit together, not in just battle bros, not in just he's the hero, but in their relationship to the Lord. Some have hinted and indicated, we'll talk a little more about this as we walk through uh, 1 Samuel. There is a lot of modern comment from certain areas and belief and people that seem to want to indicate that there's something between David and Jonathan more than just a friendship because Jonathan later or David later says he loved him more than the love of a woman he surpassed the love of a woman so they want to insinuate there's something romantic here that is not it at all we'll look a little further as we go that is a complete lie they are knit 
not in a love that is sinful toward one another. That's someone trying to condone something that God does not condone. They are knit in love in their relationship in the Lord. And David's testimony of Jonathan is that I've never even found a romantic love that was as loyal and bound to me as the love that Jonathan and I have for one another through our relationship in the Lord. So Jonathan loves David after hearing his heart and soul. The people love David after seeing his life and his victories. Look down at verse 16. All Israel and Judah love David. Notice this, because he, he went out and came in. What's that phrase mean? It just means they kept seeing David. David was named as commander of a thousand different soldiers, and they would go out and they fight battles, and they saw David win victories after victory, but he didn't change. They saw that David wasn't lifted or puffed up like a king or proud, but that David went in and he came out, and he went in and he came out. And when the people saw the way he lived on a regular basis, they loved him. Michael, you know, eventually loves him as a husband. We're not even sure all how they knew each other other than David was in and out of Saul's household, but we see that even Michael loved, or Michal, I say, we'll say it that way. Michal is uh, the daughter's name but that she loves David. So everyone else loves David, but I want you to notice that number two, Saul misses that completely. Now, that does not mean that any time that the majority of people love or like something or they approve something, that we should love, like, or approve it. That's not our measurement or our standard. However, here is Jonathan, who clearly has a love and desire for the Lord in relationship with him, and the people of Israel who... As a whole, it does not mean that they were all righteous and good, but they are the people and children of God. They see something in David that Saul would not. Sometimes when we feel like we're standing alone and everyone else in life, that we're right and everyone else is wrong about how they're thinking about something, that within the context of Jesus' body, within the context of the church and church family, that God has given us all the same Holy Spirit and that God gives discernment to his people. And so there could be, if there is someone or something or there is some way in life that you're just constantly find yourself at odds or opposed with everyone else in life, there's a good reason to assess your own heart. And Saul should have done that, but he doesn't. I want you to notice that Saul missed what everyone else saw in David because he was so focused on himself. We miss what God is doing in the lives of other believers when I'm so focused on me. When I look at them and I only see the outward, I miss what God is doing and trying to do in their life and how I could even be a part of that. Saul was so focused on himself. Who won the battle? Who gets the credit for the battle? What happens now that the battle is over? Remember, he's drawing people in. The Spirit of God leaves him and an evil spirit kind of comes over him. He's distressed. He's distraught. Bring me someone that can calm me down. They actually bring David to him to play the liar. We read just a moment ago that Saul even tries to kill him twice in the midst of that. David's trying to help him. David won a battle that Saul couldn't win. David played to soothe his heart when his heart could find no rest. David has only done good things for Saul, but Saul can't see that because he's focused on himself. And sometimes we hurt people that are in our lives that want to help or that even are fighting alongside of us. We hurt them when we are focused on self and not on the Lord. Notice how we see the characterization of Saul's hatred. First, Saul's first response to David was to possess and control him. You notice that it says when it describes Jonathan, notice what Jonathan did. Jonathan was knit with the soul of David in verse number one. Jonathan loved him at the end of verse number one. Verse three, Jonathan made a covenant with him. Verse four, Jonathan takes off his robe, his armor, his battle gear, and gives it to David. So Jonathan, in, in, in comparison, Jonathan links himself to David and gives to David. Saul brings David to himself and takes. He wants what David can offer him. And it shows the difference between their life and their relationship. And so Saul fears, he hears, he calls at the end of chapter 17 that we looked at last week, he says, whose son is this? Even though it appears in the timeline that David had already been in his house, he didn't really know a whole lot about David from chapter 16 to 17, as he had already returned home from playing once, and then he's called back into the battle, and 
So he says, who is this? So I don't know who this is. But the more that he finds out about David, he draws, he wants to possess and control him. 1 Samuel 14, 52, we've read it a couple times the last few weeks, you don't have to turn there, but it says, there was sore war against the Philistines all the days of Saul. And when Saul saw any strong man or any valiant man, he took him unto him. So it says, Saul, anytime Saul found someone he thought would help him and his position and his battles and fight for him, he would draw those people to himself. And he does the same thing here with David. So why is this a problem? Look back. We're going to set up a little bit of something in our mind. Look at chapter 17. Look at verse 25. Chapter 17, verse 25. It's going to give us a clue that Saul is not a man of his word and that his heart does not match his word. Notice 1725. The men of Israel said, Have you seen this day? Uh, have you seen this man that is come up? Surely to defy Israel is he come up, and it shall be that the man who killeth him, he's talking about Goliath, the man who kills Goliath, the king will enrich him with great riches, and will give him his daughter, and make his father's house free free in Israel. What does that mean? He's going to make his father's house free. Well, very, the other two are pretty simple. He's going to give him his daughter. He's going to give his daughter to be married. He's going to give him riches. He's going to make him wealthy. And he's going to set his father's house free. Meaning anyone that lives in that man's household, in his father's household, there are no taxes and there is no requirement to come and serve in that military way. Remember how Samuel said the king's going to take your things. He's going to take your cattle. He's going to take your wealth. He's going to take your sons. So the person who kills Goliath, his father's house is to be free from taxes and from service. And yet here in the very beginning of the very next chapter, it tells us that Saul requires David to come live and serve him. So Saul is already not holding up his end of the deal. It's kind of fast forwarding. We know that Saul offers his daughter to David to be married. Why hadn't he already done that in the first place? Because the man that killed Goliath, was, that was the offer to him. We know that David then says, I can't marry because I don't have enough. I'm poor. I don't have enough money to give a dowry for a king's daughter. He says, I'm a poor man. So evidently, none of the things that had been promised to the man that killed Goliath had Saul given to David. He's not a man of his word when it is not convenient. So notice, Saul possesses and controls. And what can we learn from that? <coughs> we have a little application section after each one of these. Our hatred or our dislike. Sometimes, sometimes we hate someone and we just call it a difference of personality. But notice it says sometimes our hatred or our dislike of someone can often be masked by our constant presence with them. Manipulating or manipulation of a person or their life is actually an insult to the divine possession of God over their life. Sometimes we dislike people. Sometimes we mistreat people. Sometimes we manipulate people. We do something to someone in a way that makes them feel guilty if they don't do what we want them to do. That, that it questions their allegiance. It questions their love. If you are not or don't do what I want you to do, then do you even really love me? And can I reciprocate that love to you? It's holding their emotion. It's holding their love hostage. And that's exactly kind of what Saul does to David throughout this time. It looks like Saul treats David like everyone else does. But in reality, he just uses him. Saul, notice this, he heard the hymns of victory as a personal insult. He heard what he wanted to hear. He saw what he wanted to see. And there's a good chance, think about this. Look in verse 6. came to pass as they came when David was returned from the slaughter of the Philistine that the women came out of all cities of Israel. So this is not just one city. But as Saul would travel through Israel, women would come out singing and dancing. Notice this phrase, mark it if you need to. To meet King Saul with tabrets, with joy, and with instruments of music. There is no indication that anything here is sarcastic. There is no indication that they are singing with any sort of insult or slam or that they're belittling Saul. Do you think that if you were in one of these Saul's, uh, in one of these cities under a monarchy and you look up and Saul the king is coming, that you're going to go out and in his face sing a song that mocks him? Like there is not a democratic process to the judicial system in Israel at this point. You can die of treason, right? So it is highly unlikely that these women are actually coming out to mock him. You say, well, they sing about Saul is thousand and David is ten thousand. Hebrew poetry and literature, read most of the Psalms. 
Ever notice how the Psalms build on one another? If it lists one number in one verse or line, the number gets bigger as you go. It talks about something that is big, great, mighty, a fortress, and it grows. It builds one line to the next. The song is very simple. Saul began this battle against the Philistines. Remember, he's been going around fighting the Philistines. Saul has slain his thousands. Now David has come along, and we have slain tens of thousands. It's not to mock Saul, but Saul hears the praises of these people that are celebrating the victory that God has given them, and he takes it as a personal insult. He hears about and sees what God has done and used David to free his people and to fight the enemy, and he cannot but hear it as an insult to his own personal achievements in nature. You ever find yourself in the same position? Jealous and insecure, making us disdain even the blessings of God and the joys of God amongst believers and amongst one another? There's no secret that in American culture and in society that church families and churches and sometimes get in this competition within the church sometimes and then with other churches sometimes. Let's just be honest. I mean, it's, it's a very regular thing. It shouldn't be, but it happens. And there's this competition that goes back and forth in our own lives. Someone that has a different personality, someone that has a different style, a church that does something a little different, a church that may hold to scriptural values and the gospel and may hold to the inerrance, uh, the inerrance of God's word. They may be in absolute companionship with what they're trying to do. They're just a little too close in proximity to us. And so there's bad mouthing. And so there's gossip. And so there's talking. And even when, there are, when God blesses one group of Christians or another, or God blesses one believer within the church or another, we cannot help but disdain and dislike what God is doing in someone else's life because it's not ours. Because I didn't get it. Because it seems like they're singing their praises more than they're singing my praises. And we hate that. You know who else hates it? God hates it. Here is Saul who hears the praises of the people. And I, I honestly believe this was not meant to disrespect Saul. But that's all that Saul can think in his mind. He becomes consumed with it. Do you hear them? Do you hear what they're saying about that other person? Yeah, they're saying David saved us. <laughs> They're saying that we were fighting the Philistines and then we were stuck for 40 days and nothing happened. And God brought along a kid named David. And David didn't do anything un un incredible or mighty himself, but God used David in a sling and the, whoom, bam, the Goliath was dead. And then all the men of Israel went down and fought a battle and we slew thousands of Philistines and we won the victory and God used them to do something mighty and to free us from our enemies. And Saul cannot hear the praise going toward what God had done. All he heard was other people belittling his own efforts. Sometimes our own jealousy and insecurity distracts us from what God is doing. Then notice Saul becomes consumed with David, keeping him constantly in mind. It says he kept him in his eye, verse number 9, from that day forward. He eyed him from that day forward. You know, and Saul becomes irrational and inconsistent. He elevates David, right? Bring David and let him live in my house. I hate him. And then he says, you know what? I'm going to make David like, he's going to play for me to soothe my soul, but I'm going to be so angry at him that he can't soothe my soul. So while he's playing for me to soothe my soul, I'm going to try to kill him a couple times. Then I'm going to make him captain of a thousand soldiers. But when I make him captain of a thousand soldiers, I'm going to try to manipulate the circumstances in life so that my enemies will beat us and kill David. He doesn't care who gets in the way. He involves his daughters. He involves his son later. He involves the enemy. He involves troops. He is so irrational and inconsistent. He is consumed. Do you ever feel like that about our own lives? That our responses to people, that are my response to my spouse, to my children, to my brother and sister in Christ within my own church. Do you ever feel like sometimes our responses are irrational and inconsistent? Sometimes it's because I'm so focused on self and not the Lord. We should be willing to think about our own thoughts, assess our own thoughts toward 
other people by God's Spirit. Our lips sometimes speak love, blessing, and desire, and success. That's what we say, but in actuality, we're afraid of what might happen. And we're actually enraged inside when other people don't see things the way that we do, and especially when other people don't see other people the same way that we do. You ever heard somebody praise another person, talk about this person is a blessing in my life, this person helped me, this person did this, and you sit there and you realize, that person just frustrates the fire out of me. How in the world do you get blessing from the person that annoys me to death? But that's exactly what happens with Saul. He looks around, Jonathan loves David. The people love David. Michael loves David. His servants love David. He hates David. He's consumed by it. He becomes irrational, up and down and up and down. And our behavior is irrational. We should take note and assess and ask God by His Spirit to teach. Notice the final thing, number three. Saul gives, you've seen these master classes different places, right? You know, someone's the expert opinion and authority. Saul gives a master class on the instability of a double-minded man. He says anything to get what he wants. He talks about spiritual things when he needs to talk about spiritual things. He talks about battle when he needs to talk about battle. He talks about Saul and he makes promises. He'll promise something to one person and then defy it and do something different in the next. He is all up and down. It's all about Saul. Notice at first he offers his oldest daughter. Merib was her name. And he offers her, think about this, he offers his daughter to David so that it will put David in danger. I mean, dads, can you, can you imagine doing that with your own daughter that you, you hate someone so much? that you include her in a plot to get the man killed? Like, what, ha what did he think was going to happen? That somehow if David's trapped by the Philistines, he becomes target enemy number one of the Philistine people, that if they go after David, that somehow they're going to spare his daughter if she's there? And even if she's not there and only David is killed, the heartbreak that he is establishing and, and creating what he wants in her life, but he is willing to put anyone in harm's way. He calls this out, and remember, this would have already been done. Technically, David was do this right, however we agree with the ancient times and giving of children away in this way or not. This was already what was promised in chapter 17. Saul was willing to use good things for bad purposes. Join the royal family and make David the top target of the Philistines. If we can kill the king's son-in-law, the one that killed Goliath, the one that keeps killing all the other Philistines. He had these hidden intentions. He spoke with love and concern. Notice in verse 17, Behold, my older daughter Merib, her will I give to thee to wife. Only be thou, for me, thou, be thou valiant for me and fight the Lord's battles. He even invokes the Lord in what he's trying to do. I mean, this is the ultimate. Would that not be the ultimate definition of a sinister and evil plan? to evoke the Lord's name and plan, all while in the background, my intention is to hurt someone else. Sometimes, if we're honest as Christians, and all we can just pray is, God, be merciful to us as sinners, direct our minds and hearts, and help us pull away from this kind of sin, because it does happen that Christians, in the name of the Lord, hurt and harm other people and act like everything's fine. Marry my daughter and just, just fight for me. Notice that David kind of defers. He puts it away. He says, who am I? What is my life or my father's family in Israel that I should be son-in-law? I can't afford to be the son-in-law of the king. There's dowries at that time, all sorts of things that are insinuated. But notice in the background, Saul is saying, I can't put my hand on him for whatever reason because he's the one that killed Goliath. But let the Philistines... The hand of the Philistines be upon him. Let them kill him. Saul eventually gives this daughter away. It came to pass that Saul's daughter should have been given to David, but the time comes. I don't know if there was a time he was supposed to get a dowry together. David considered it. They thought about it. Whatever happens, they give him to another man. Side note, in 2 Samuel chapter 21, verse number 8, it actually tells us that this man has five sons, and they are actually raised by Michal. It doesn't tell us what happened. But somehow, it's a, that's a unique uh, tie together that 
Merib's, it would seem, five sons, or at least her husband's five sons, are raised by Michael, the one, Michal, the one that's given to David. And so he says that plan didn't work, which we should think about empty words and offers meant to indebt someone to us are sinful. That is sinful. To, to, to promise and to flatter someone, to do favor after favor, to be kind, to lavish ourselves someone on, on someone, knowing that eventually we're going to ring the bell to call it back. That is a sinful motivation. And Saul offers something good with evil intention. It should never be said of us. Then Saul plots to use his second daughter, Michal, and David's love against the two of them against David. It tells us in verse 20 that uh, Michal loves David. You say, well, how do we know that David loved Michal? Because of what we read at the end of the chapter and what he is willing to do to marry her. You don't do that. If you got to the end of the chapter, we'll get there in a minute. You don't do that for someone you're just meh about. Like, David likes this girl. It would seem, he seems very intent to try to love her and try to follow after her. And Saul evidently sees that and he uses it. He manipulates someone else's emotions toward each other. He uses two other parties that he has attachment to in two different ways. And he manipulates them to get what he wants. He's so consumed with his own insecurity and his hatred that he will use his own family for evil intentions. And Saul twists something that God uses to bless, in this case, the love of a man and woman for one another, hoping that it will lead to the downfall of David. He puts David in danger. He creates a volatile circumstance for others, all of those that love David and even Michal herself. So what do we learn from this? It's a serious and sinful thing to be willing to put others into conflict in hopes of hurting one or elevating self. It's not how a Christian should handle God's image bearers. Christians, the world responds to one another this way. They pit each other against each other. You see it in our system, our political system, our society. You see it within families. You see it with, between husband and wife, pitting each other against children, children pitting each other against their parents. You see, you see all kinds of, this is the way that the world has learned to work. I will plug and play and switch and move and I will toy with emotions and I'll turn this person against this person. If I see that they've grown too close, I will tear them apart so that I can grow closer to one or the other or both. I will manipulate every circumstance in life to get what I want. That's exactly what Saul is doing. It's devious and it's sinful. Saul uses this plan but here's what we want to notice as we finish out this point. Even though Saul puts this plan into place, he could not change the sovereign will of God. And aren't you glad that even though the world misuses, has taught us to misuse one another, here's my thought, my heart, my goal, my hope for us as a Christian people and as a church, that we would not fall into the temptation to treat one another or even to treat others in this world as though they are merchandise or tools to be used. That is the way that sin and the world uses human beings. They devalue human life because they don't see it as created by God and precious because of the value that He puts on it. We treat one another in our relationships with quality, thinking that it only affects us, but in reality, it affects the way that others view each other before the Lord. It affects the glory and the honor of God. So, evidently Saul gives this timeline to David. You see it at the end of verse 26. When his servants told David these words, it pleased David well to be the king's son-in-law, and the days were not expired. That means evidently Saul puts a time limit. So he says, I need you to kill 100 Philistines, and I need you to bring me proof. That's what he says at the Last part of the uh, verse number 25, kill 100 Philistines, bring me proof. And you have to do it by a certain amount of time. Now, like when you're carrying out, mili some of you have been in the military, when you carry out military practice or you carry out a military, not just a drill, but an actual mission, yes, speed can be important, but rushing is never the priority, right? So Saul presents, do this and do it as fast. He, he sets a time limit on him. And it actually comes back to bite him, David, 
is empowered by the Lord himself. We know, of course, David arose, he and his men, and slew of the Philistines 200 men. He doubles it. So Saul's plan backfires because it was not the plan of the Lord. The plan of God, which was for David to be king, cannot be changed by manipulation or by sinister plans. And we should know and remember this as well. When Saul realized that God was in control, his response was to fear. It was to have animosity. Notice, if you would, verse 28. If he wondered what, if Saul was just, maybe Saul's just confused, right? Let's give him the benefit of the doubt. He thinks, Dave, he doesn't know David's anointed to be the king. He thinks somebody's taken his kingdom. Like uh, Until God says somebody else is supposed to be king, now yes, yeah, Saul knows he has to leave the throne, or that his throne, the throne's going to depart from his house, but until he, he doesn't know that David has been anointed, surely he's just confused, right? Notice verse 28, And Saul saw and knew that the Lord was with David, and that Michal, Saul's daughter, loved him. Saul knew in his heart exactly what was happening and the truth is in our lives that when there are times that animosity when jealousy when anger when hatred uh, when greed uh, when a dislike of something or someone comes into our heart we are willing to pit ourselves even against the very will of God but we should remember that the Lord protects his own he guides their lives Human manipulation is never successful. Let's close with a couple of verses. You see them there on the back. <clears throat> As we noted in our study, all human hearts look for a leader, right? We, we said that from them. We're created to be led by someone. We're created to be led by God. But we look for a leader. This world is looking for leaders, someone to take us, someone as the uh, Israelites said in Samuel, someone to go out for us and fight our battles. Some of the first readers of the book of Samuel would actually have been exiles, scattered. They feel abandoned. They have no leader. But the message of the book of Samuel is to encourage them that another perfect leader is coming. David ultimately would fail as king. And we know if we read through the rest of Samuel in a sitting, you'll find it very quickly. In chapter 18, verse 23, David says, I am a poor man. I am lightly esteemed. That means I have little reputation. But eventually David would be the king. And eventually he'd look on Bathsheba and he would no longer see himself as poor with a small reputation. He would see himself as wealthy and deserving of honor and glory and of taking, of great reputation. But we can be thankful tonight in our hearts as we look to Jesus he outkings all of the kings. Isaiah 66, verse 2 says of the coming Messiah, To this man will I look, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit, and trembleth at my word. Philippians, familiar to us, chapter 2, but made himself of no reputation, the exact words that David said, of, no, of little respect, of little esteemed. He made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, was made in the likeness of men. Being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. So what do we learn from this passage tonight? Uh, let's go, I uh, went too quick there. Let's go back and just think through those two phrases. Start with Saul. Saul's mind and heart were sinful and worldly. When we sense Saul's heart in our own, we should repent and return to the Lord. Ask ourselves tonight, do I have this mind of Saul or the mind of Christ? David, we can learn from the example of David who remained so focused on the Lord that whether it was his brother on the battlefield chiding him, whether it was Saul on the battlefield telling him he wasn't great enough, whether it was Goliath on the battlefield cursing him, or whether it was Saul trying to kill him in chapter 18, or whether it was the people singing his praises, talking about how great he was and everyone learning to love David. It didn't matter. He was so focused on God that he handled it all properly. And then finally tonight as we pray, may we be thankful for Jesus who is the perfect, poor, and lowly king. He will one day reign over all. They were waiting for David to become king. Jesus one day will rule visibly over all things. And for today, we serve him. Father, thank you for your word.
and that it teaches us. You are good and gracious. Thank you for the lesson from from David's life, from Saul, from Saul, the warnings of what our hearts, a very clear illustration of how to be double-minded, trying to be religious, but focused on self. We learn of how to mistreat your creatures as he mistreated David, his own daughter, his own son, and his people. We learn from the example of David how to remain grounded and focused on you regardless of our circumstance. But ultimately, Lord, we learn about Jesus, who is all the things that no earthly human leader could ever be. So may we serve Jesus and Jesus only. In Jesus' name, amen. If you would, take your uh, prayer list tonight. We'll close with a word of prayer this evening and just looking over some things here. You see your prayer quest for our church and ministries of our church. We have couple people coming soon to, to join our church and thankful for that and uh, over the next few weeks as, as they come we welcome them and uh, was praying for a spirit of unity our missionaries that we've had uh, on the bulletins the last few weeks and praying over them still waiting on an update from Mrs. Lily the Sharon Lily that we gave you on Sunday so just continue to pray if you would for her then praying tonight for for the application of what we've learned about the Bible from the Bible in church this week Sunday we study patience. Tonight we study sincerity of our hearts. And so let's pray tonight over our families, over ourselves, and over our church. That God will help us apply those, those things to our own lives and souls. And then continue to pray for Mary Martin, still in the hospital recovering, slow recovery. Just pray that she'd be encouraged in the midst of all that she's going through right now, uh, still trying to recover from those other procedures. Barbara Sharp's daughter, she gave me an update this past Sunday. Uh, they are trying to make decisions for treatments as the, the tumor size has actually grown and they found some more spots. And so if you would just continue to pray for her, for John Charles um, in his cancer battle and then uh, others that you see there. You see Dan Hubbard's name on the list. Uh, I went and saw, was able to see Dan um, Saturday. His uh, family called and he had had a stroke a couple months ago, recovered. And then this last week, just a sudden battle with some uh, he's had some kidney and liver function issues and, and really did not look good for, for a very short time, like he may not um, survive, and, uh, but we're thankful he has. He's turned the corner, and they seem to have a good prognosis. So if you would, just uh, pray for uh, Dan Hubbard as well and then other church members uh, that are not feeling well. Uh, let's spend about three or four minutes tonight together in prayer, as couples, as families, um, there with a friend that's near you. Share a prayer request, something that you have on your own heart, praise, something the Lord's taught you, and then uh, we'll close in prayer in just a moment.